Hello everybody, it's Professor Fiore. In today's video, we are going to take a look at the analysis of lag networks for junction field effect transistors. In other words, we're going to look at JFET high frequency performance. How do we do that? Now, if you have not watched the videos on JFET lead networks, the low frequency response, and you haven't watched the one on Miller's theorem, you should watch those before this video. And I'll just wait for you to do that. Okay, now that you've done that, let's go take a look at the circuit we're going to use. So you'll notice this is basically the same circuit we used for the low frequency analysis. I've changed some of the coupling caps, but otherwise same thing. So what did we find in that video? This little FET had uh, a voltage gain of around 5 inverting. Just to help us a little bit here, I've done some calculations. So I'm going to pull this up. Now here is the trick. There are capacitances associated with the active device. Okay? And what I have to do is turn those things into lead networks. One of them, right here, the cap that goes from the uh, gate over to the drain, is in the Miller position. So we're going to have to Millerize that to come up with an output capacitance and an input capacitance. And then, of course, we have a cap going here, the gate to source cap. Now, in small signal FETs like this, those are usually just a few picofarads each. But in something like a power FET, like a power MOS FET, that... Uh, gate source capacitance can be pretty high. That can be a few thousand nano, uh, excuse me, a few thousand picofarads. In other words, a few nanofarads. Pretty big numbers. So you need something, a source that has decent current to sort of, uh, you know, drive that without a lot of, of uh, DVDT, you know, slewing kinds of uh, distortion. All right. Okay. So we know that we have an inverting gain of about five. I go off to my data sheet and I get these numbers, which don't quite look like what I want. In other words, I want a CGD back here. I want a CGS over here. So I have a little bit of a problem. It's giving me these things called CISS and CRSS. This is what I want. In other words, here's my cap, right? The gate, the drain, the source. I want to know what the gate to drain capacitance is. I want to know what the um, you know, gate to source cap and the drain to source cap. Now, it works out for this FET that those numbers are about one and a half picofarads, three picofarads, and the drain source is small enough to ignore. So they gave us instead these parameters called CISS and CRSS. Well, CRSS is the reverse uh, transfer capacitance, which happens to be the same as CGD. So that's good. You know, that's not much work. But CISS is actually a combination, and this is the test circuit they would use. CISS is the input capacitance in a common source configuration. Notice the source is at ground, so it's a common source configuration with the output shorted. So here's the output shorted, and you measure the capacitance looking in this way. Well, what do you see? Well, you see CGS going to ground, and then the Miller position cap, right, the uh, gate to drain cap, winds up going to ground. So those two things are basically in parallel, and caps in parallel, of course, just add up. So CISS is equivalent to CGS plus CGD. I look this up on my data sheet, and it says CISS is 4.5 picofarads. So we can see from our definition, the CGS would be CISS minus CRSS. So I'm going to take that 4.5, I'm going to subtract the CRSS, or the CGD, at 1.5, and, and that gives us the 3 picofarads. So this is what we really have. It would be nice, like I said, if the, if the manufacturer just gave us those numbers, but this is how they measure them, so this is what they're going to give us. Okay. Now, on some data sheets, you will see values for CGS and CGD. Be careful, don't use those. Same thing would happen in uh, a uh, simulation model. The values that you're going to see are for a zero bias. In other words, for CGS, for, excuse me, for VGS equaling zero. 
but we don't bias our FETs at zero. Right? We have some negative voltage. And when you have a negative voltage, that PN junction, the depletion region, grows. So it gets fatter. And the, and the other pieces of that, kind of like plates on a capacitor, are farther apart. And consequently, the capacitance goes down. And, you know, a data sheet might give you a plot of how the uh, capacitance varies uh, with reverse bias. And if they do, well, you can just look that up. Otherwise, we're just going to rely on these typical values for CISS and CRSS. Okay, so as I said, uh, our semi, um, on semi, the company that manufactures this uh, 5458 uh, JFET tells us CRSS is one and a half picofarads typically and uh, four and a half picofarads for CISS, right? The max values are what you're getting out at that zero bias point. They don't specify a COSS, which would be the capacitance out here. So we can assume that that um, drain to source capacitance is small enough to ignore. All right, so here's our lag analysis, right? The feedback capacitor for the Miller position is C gate to drain. We know that's a one and a half picofarads. So the C out Miller, remember the Miller effect is going to take this impedance and multiply it by A over A plus 1. Well, remember, reactance, capacitive reactance, is the reciprocal of capacitance, right? Uh, as far as proportionality is concerned, it varies as the reciprocal. So C out Miller, instead of being um, A over A plus 1, is A plus 1 over A. And with a gain of five, that's six fifths. So we're going to get six fifths of one and a half picofarads. That's 1.8 picofarads. Right? That's all we have for the output for capacitance. The input end, we have to Millerize that uh, cap again. And that would turn out to be multiplied by A plus one. Again, capacitance versus capacitive reactance. If we had a capacitive reactance, we would divide it by A plus one. But we have the capacitance, so again, the reciprocal, we multiply it by a plus one. So one and a half picofarads times six, that's nine. So I've got 1.8 picofarads out here for the C out Miller. I've got nine picofarads over here for the C in Miller. Now the calculation for the critical frequencies, these are just straight lag networks. What do I have on the output? Well, you know, my coupling capacitor, that's a short, you know, we treat it as a short for, um, middle range frequencies. So for really high frequencies, it's still a short. Power supplies uh, shorted to ground, and we wind up with RD, the biasing resistor, in parallel with our load, 12K. So a 6K in parallel with 12K is going to get us 4K. And we determined before the C, the C value at the output is 1.8 picofarads. So we put that into our handy-dandy uh, critical frequency equation, 1 over 2 pi RC, 4K, 1.8 pico. That gives us 22.1 megahertz. So I expect a roll off at 22.1 megahertz from this output network. On the input end, right, when I look into here, so I've, got, I've got a cap over here, which is the combination, again, of that Miller and that um, gate to source capacitance, okay? What do I have for resistance? Well, you know, R in gate is basically infinity. I've got 2 meg over here. This cap is a short. The source is a short. And I've got the 50 ohm generator impedance going back to ground. So basically, it's 50 in parallel with 2 meg, which is 50. All right. So the input network has an R value of 50 ohms and a C value of the uh, gate source capacitance, which is 3 picofarads plus the input Miller of 9 that we already calculated back here. So that's 12 pico. So I take 50 ohms, 12 pico, put them in my equation, and we get 265 megahertz, okay? Now in the real world, every resistor has a small finite amount of, of uh, capacitance associated with it, probably a fraction of a picofarad. And of course we have wiring capacitance, you know, on a PC board or, you know, actual physical wires that will add in. So we'll actually have more capacitance in the real world than what we've got here, okay? But be that as it may, Let's see what we get. So we're going to go up and do um, an AC analysis, the AC transfer characteristic, and see what we get. 
All righty. Now remember, we are expecting 22.1 meg and 265. Obviously, the 22.1 is going to be dominant. That's where we would expect the break to be. So let's come down here. And you can see as I move this around, our uh, gain is about 14 decibels. And just as we did on the low end, you know, we're looking for a three decibel drop. So around 11 is what we're looking for gain. Or, 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 or. So somewhere around here. And we're getting about uh, 24 and a half, 25, somewhere around there. So let's just call that um, 25 megahertz. All right. And, you know, we had calculated 22.1. Okay, not too bad. I don't expect these things to be perfect. I mean, we are estimating, you know, we're using a typical value for CISS and CRSS. And as I mentioned, they are in reality controlled by at least in part what the bias level is. So um, we can expect a little bit of deviation there. All right, now the other part of this is how do I determine, right? That's the output network. I wouldn't see the effect of the input network because it's so high, right? It's 10 times higher, 265 megahertz. So how, how do I go about finding this guy? Well, one way to do that is to translate the input lag network well below what the output lag network is. Now, the other thing you could do is, is try to translate this up, but that's going to kind of mess a whole bunch of stuff up. Um, you know, we'd have to decrease these resistor values and that would mess with the gain and, you know, things aren't even anymore. So since our gen, the gen, the internal source impedance was uh, the real determiner in our calculation, why don't we just make that bigger, right? So instead of 50 ohms, let's bring that up to 5k ohms. So I've brought that up by a factor of 100, which should translate the critical frequency on the input end down by a factor of 100. So instead of 265 megahertz, we should be looking at, you know, 2.6 megahertz or something like that, All right? There'll be a little bit of loss from the output network and that might alter our, um, our graph just a smidge, but, you know, we expect something in that sort of mid to uh, range. All right, let's see what we get. Boink. All right, so again, there's our mid-band gain of, of 14, you know, or five in ordinary form, right? And I'm looking for about 11 over here. So, you know, again, so we're looking at just about 2.4, just 2.357, around 2.4 megahertz for that, right? So as I said, we translated this down by a factor of 100 by bringing R up by a factor of 100. And, you know, that's looking pretty good, okay? All right, let's turn this back to where it was. We can exploit the Miller effect to force our critical frequency to a new place. This might have way more bandwidth than we need. You know, if this was a little audio amplifier, I don't need my circuit to go up to 22 megahertz. If I was using it for ultrasonics, I wouldn't need it to go this high. Maybe a couple of hundred kilohertz would be sufficient. So how do I force this thing down? You know, when we looked at the lead networks, it was a simple matter of computing the coupling and bypass caps, you know, given the associated resistances to find a critical frequency. Um, you know, what do I do here? Well, you could sort of brute force, just add some parallel capacitance, but... The nice way to do this is to exploit Miller's theorem. So I'm going to take a capacitor and I am going to put it right here in uh, the Miller position, right? In that sort of feedback position. Now remember, whatever this capacitance is, it's going to be multiplied by the Miller effect, okay? So what I'm going to do is I am going to put in... 150 picofarads. All righty. Uh, let's move this down so you can actually see the value. All right. Why did I choose 
that. Well, it was 1.5. So, you know, I just pumped it up by a factor of 100. Let's make it easy. It's a smidge more. It's 150 plus 1.5, but basically by a factor of 100. So that's going to crank up the capacitances I see at the output and the input networks by that same factor, right? Again, you had this um, on the output end, you had to figure out your C out Miller. Your C out Miller now is 1.5 pico from the transistor in parallel with 150. So it's really 151.5, roughly 150, right? So again, Millerize, multiply that by uh, six fifths, and um, you know, we get our, our new value, which will be about 180 picofarads rather than 1.8. So I would expect this F out to drop down by a factor of 100, right? So from 22-ish megahertz, I expect to drop this down to about 220 kilohertz. Similarly, the F in is going to drop, but out of the two, the F out is going to be the dominant one. We can do the same trick. You know, once we do this, we can go back and change the R gen to 5K to verify that, in fact, the F in um, has changed by a similar amount. But I'm going to leave that to you as an exercise. Let's just see what we get here. So we've added this 150. All righty. we got an interesting little step response over here. But I really care about, there's my gain of 14. I really care about where this drops down 3 dB. In other words, a gain of about 11. Okay, close enough. I'm getting uh, 255 kilohertz. And as I said, we were expecting about um, 220. So not bad. All right. Not bad at all. Okay. So that is essentially how we look at the uh, high frequency performance of our FET. So we have two networks. The lower frequency is the, uh, the one that dominates. We can tailor that down by adding in a Miller capacitance. This is a very uh, common, popular sort of thing that people do to tailor the frequency response. You just have the one, and it's nice because it affects both input and output. And, uh, you know, it it's, is multiplied on the input end. So it's kind of like getting a big capacitor for free, right? You're only paying for a, for a small capacitor, so to speak, but you're effectively getting a much larger capacitor out here because of the, the Miller multiplication effect, all right? Now, the other end of it, if you want to make it wider, in other words, if you want to make the F2 go to a higher frequency, you don't have an easy way of subtracting out capacitance. So, you know, it's easy to manipulate the coupling capacitors to change those critical frequencies up or down. Um, on the lag end, you know, you can you can decrease the bandwidth, but trying to increase it's going to require getting a faster transistor or a redesign of the circuit itself. You're going to have to monkey with the C and R values directly. So that's not a trivial exercise. Decreasing it, no problem. Increasing that high frequency, a little bit of work. All right? Okay. So... Why don't you build this, try the, uh, the little translation effect there on our gen, and see if you can verify the input network with our Miller capacitance. Okay? Alrighty, we'll see you next time.